and blessings to the world in the name of Ijah, Isaac, Jacob and Abraham, the God of my ancestors, I bid you love. Greetings ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for tuning in to the Sir Squeeze Back Show and I hope for those of you who celebrate the Christmas holidays you celebrated it with your family or friends. And do remember, it's not about the gifts. Because Christmas has now become a thing of gifts. I'm going to share a little story with you. I have a grandniece. Right before she made four years old, she came up from Virginia to visit. And um, I came in the house, no gifts in my hand. And when I'm leaving and I'm telling her bye, she stopped me and she says, you really came here with just your two long hands? And she wasn't even four yet. So I'm saying this, the pressure that we put in on ourselves to provide these gifts, and then for the rest of the year we are working to pay this off, we have to get back to the real facts of the matter. Christ is what we focused on. And it's about being kind and loving to each other. Um, I want to give you guys a progress report on my mom and dad since we took them out the nursing home. Um, previously on the show we talked about the problems the family were en encountered in dealing with the system and since they have been home it's now going to be a year and probably two months and mom is now 89 years old, dad is 91 Dad has deteriorated a little bit mentally, but he is happy. Mom is happy. And um, I know for a fact, had we left them within that system, I wouldn't be able to give you this report now. Because, you know, I don't blame the workers at these facilities. I blame the system that is in place. And for those of you out there who do have loved ones if they're in these facilities, you have to be on top of it. You have to keep going over and over. Don't just go in the morning, stop in there during lunchtime, during dinner. And if you can, stop in before they put them to bed so you could see what is happening with them. And garbage in, garbage out. So the foundation that you're laying right now, the examples that you're setting right now, I, I'm quite sure that's what you're going to be experiencing later on in your life. So take the time out to visit the older folks in your, in, in your family, our friends, our neighbors, who you know are not able to do for themselves. Do whatever you can. Don't wait on the next person. My sister Karen and I um, are the primary caregiver, but my brother Artie, my youngest brother Keith, and my oldest sister Sadie is very active. My oldest brother is not as hands-on as we'd like to see him, but we understand how the work environment is now and people are pressured into working. So, you know, we're not throwing any blame on anyone when we don't see them as often as we would like to see them. But we would like for everybody who is in earshot of this program to start focusing on those folks around you. Don't count on the nursing home system. Don't count on the systems that's just set up there to house these folks like furniture in a warehouse. And for the children, you have to give the children quality time. Don't just buy the gifts, throw it to them, especially now with the advent of the computer and the cell phone that everybody is addicted to the cell phone. No one is talking to anyone anymore too much. You, you need to really focus on instilling in your children the need to talk. And instead of giving them $5, $10, say go buy a McDonald's or whatever, maybe even if you're gonna eat the fast food, try to do it together collectively as a family. Again, I wanna thank you 
for tuning into the show. We have a very live show for you today. Um, oftentimes, you you hear about folks that are going through struggles, ailments. I have a veteran that I'm going to be talking to today who is a blind veteran, and he's also a Vietnam veteran, but he's also an author. Um, his name is Leon Collier, and he goes by the pen name Christopher Rawlin, and I'm going to be talking with him today, so he probably could give you some insight as to what propelled him to be in the space that he is today. So I'm going to turn now and I'm going to say, welcome, Leon. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate and it. And coming to talk to us. Yeah. Um, I want to start out by saying, life struggle of a Vietnam vet out of the Vietnam War. Now, when I first opened this book to read this book, I couldn't put it down. And you didn't start out by talking about the Vietnam War, you start by, by talking about you. And one of the things I want to say is that the Sir Squeezeback Show focuses a lot on spirituality. Um, we feel that spirituality is the key. Mm -hmm. You know, the body is important, but everybody's body is turning fertilizer at some point. Your soul, in our view, is the conversations folks have about you when you're no longer here physically. But the spirit, which was there before the body, is still there. So we pay a lot of emphasis on the spirit. And you mentioned in the book about an experience you had of numerous experiences. I might even say that I could see where your childhood prepared you to become a soldier. Because in my view, you was already a soldier before you went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, the piece I'm talking about is reference you made to your aunt, who was one of the most staunchest supporters that you had, being that your mom died when you were young and, 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 so, and so forth. Um, your, your mom had you when she was young, so you spent a lot of time with other members of the family, and in particular this one aunt mm -hmm. who died when you was what? How, many, how, how old were you? I was five. Five. five and yeah. she mentioned something to you. And you said in the book that it enabled you to know that God was with you all during, throughout that time of turmoil and suffering when you were coming up. Did you feel that God was with you when you was in Vietnam? Uh, a little background on that basically is that... Um, when I was living with my aunt, uh, it's because my mother could not no longer take care of me. So mm -hmm. I spent the summer times in North Carolina with her, mm -hmm. and I was the only child. And the adults would go to church on Sundays, mm -hmm. and the only thing I had to do was go out and play in the backyard um, uh, with a broomstick. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, every Sunday morning around 10 o'clock, she would prepare breakfast for the, the grown-up people, and then 11 o'clock, she prepared breakfast for me. Mm -hmm. And during the process of preparing the breakfast for me, she would send me outside to play in the backyard. And some very, some very, very strange things happened to me, actually, before we get to the spirituality part of it, is that uh, I used to play I guess it's called stick ball. Mm -hmm. Hit in the rocks and stuff like that with the stick. And then one particular uh, Sunday, I found a doll, a little pink doll. And when I started hitting it, it made this sound. <laughs> and that sound really got my attention. So what I would do is I would step on it, stomp it, and hit it and deflate it, and that became uh, something I would look forward to doing every Sunday. Then uh, around halfway through that two months, the neighbor's next door neighbor had a rooster, 
okay. who came over into my territory. <laughs> and I didn't like that. And we actually got into a fight each Sunday. You and, and the rooster. The rooster. And uh, the first part of the, the fight was really, the rooster really won. And when I run in the house, my mom would look at me and she would like smile, but she'd say, are you finished? And it made me feel that I was really running away from trouble. Mm -hmm. So that went on for quite a while. And each time I went out there to fight the rooster, I came up with some kind of strategy how I was going to defeat that rooster. And eventually uh, I got to the point where we got even statements on who would win, who would lose. And one particular Sunday, uh, she told me to go outside also and to play. But she called me back in the house um, very early and she said, uh, I want to take you into my bedroom. And she laid down and she said, it's time for you to grow up. At five? At five. And she died. And what I say from that, I think I saw a dub leave the room. Mm. And that, to me, that's what I say that I think God really made me, me to grow up. Uh, and basically, when I left North Carolina and came back to New York, I forgot that whole process. Mm. I forgot that whole experience. Uh, but that would come back to me again in Vietnam. Uh, on my second mission in Vietnam, uh, we had been on search and operation for almost the entire day. And I was on point. And to my right was another sergeant on point. And I was exhausted and I saw a, a tree stump by a riverbed. And I was saying, I said, I'm gonna get to that tree stump first because I am so exhausted, I'm gonna sit down. So it was like me and this sergeant racing for this tree stump. And he got there before I did, and he turned to me to sit down, and his whole head was blown off. Wow. It drains all in. And what happened? That doll from five years old came back into my life. And I said, look at that doll. So all the experience that I had in Vietnam in terms of all the bloody battles I went through, I flashed back. To that, to, ex -early that ex experience. early experience. Mm -hmm. That's why it didn't have an impact upon me until now, later on in life. So uh, that was prepared for me, and I forgot it until it first happened in Vietnam. When, when, when did you first realize that you had a problem with your sight? Well, I didn't realize until after uh, what happened is that we had got overran by uh, the Viet Cong, and we was on a firefight, and there was a big explosion, uh, and I was blown about 60 feet away from my comrades. They mm -hmm. all got killed. And I was in this hole. And the enemy came, again. Uh, yeah. And the, and the enemy came up, and I said, what am I going to do? And a voice saying to me, play dead. And so I played dead. And I was kind of looking up, and he fired down at my head, but he missed me. But I could tell he was firing because when the bullets come at your head, and hit the ground, there's spark as a flyer, mm -hmm. sparks around you. And as soon as he passed me, I got up, and then another, another person hit me behind my head. So I didn't really know exactly what was going on and all that confusion. But after the battle, about three hours later, the medic said, sit down, you're covered with blood, your head's wide open in the back. We've got to clamp it up right away. You're going to die. And from that point on, I was getting blood visions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, the first treatment was actually to clamp my head up and then to give me a pair of glasses. Mm -hmm. And it got worse over time. Okay. okay. Now, I know you had an association with the blind Veterans Helping Blind Veterans. Tell us a little bit about that organization. And how well, the Blind involved. Veterans Association is, is an organization that I, 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 I learned about later on in life because when I first got out of, of the service, I had a lot of issues, a lot of problems. And 
Uh, you mean personal problems or? Uh, well, in terms of PSD and stuff like okay, that. And okay, I, okay. I couldn't really hold a job down. Okay. I, uh, in terms of uh, trying to live have a, a normal listen, life. Normal again. life again, I couldn't do that. So I was going to different organizations, and then I stumbled across this article about the Blind Veterans Association. So I said, well, maybe I should j join this organization because there's a strong possibility I'm going to go blind. Mm. And I inquired about it, and then I joined the organization, which is a great organization for people who are legally blind or blind. And I've been there for now about six or seven years. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, I've really become the president of the organization, which we do great work for blind, legally blind people, and it's mm -hmm. a good organization to join. But is it just veterans or, or this particular organization? It's is just for, for Vietnam veterans. Veteran. Not Vietnam, veterans who are legally blind. Okay. Okay, but you got to be a veteran and be legally blind. If you're, if you're a veteran, you can't join because it's focused on blind, blind, blind and legally right, blind Right, 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 right. I got you. Now, as far as this book, in the book, I read that you went to Morris High School, and I'm familiar right. with Morris High School. That's where Colin Powell, General Colin Powell went. That's correct, yeah. When you were going to Morris High School, what was the makeup of the student body? The student body was mixed. Uh, it was uh, it was mixed, but most of the, the individuals who went there were, I would say, people of well means, middle class, middle and class so forth. That's when there. Morris was one of the top high top schools high, at the right. time. Uh, we, <clears throat> my family was very poor, but we went there. Uh, my idea when I was going to Mars, because of my aunt again, going back to her, she taught me very early in life. Education was important, mm -hmm. so I really learned very fast. Uh, so when I went to Mars, my my initial dream was to become a scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, but my guidance counsel did not encourage me in that way. He said, "You should go into teaching." <clears throat> but we, I kind of went back and forth with them. At the same time, we had on in Mars we had a, a recruitment office for, for military people there. Mm -hmm. So then. I was thinking about joining the service earlier, but then I was told, you're not going to be able to get in the military because you're the only son. Mm. They will not take you on the son. So I forgot that idea, uh, but I still was not able to pursue uh, being a scientist mm -hmm. because uh, I had such good grades in my junior year that they put me into what they call a co-op program. Mm -hmm. and I was able to work for the city a week and then go to school a week. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started making good money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, for, I forgot. Is that my, when you work with Triborough? <laughs> that's Bridge? right. Okay. And I, I, I forgot my dream because I was making money and I, I really needed the money. And I was under the impression because I was the only child, I would not be drafted into the military. Uh, How so wrong? How wrong were you? How long was I? No, how wrong, wrong, oh. <laughs> very wrong. <laughs> very, but 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 uh, that went through my life. Everyone kept telling me you're not going to be drafted. Uh, and when I decided to go for a full-time job, but I got drafted into the military. You know, what what was it that said to you? Um, I should write this book, Life Struggle of a Vietnam Veteran Out of the Vietnam War. What, 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 what was your catalyst for that? There are many, there are many reasons why I wrote the book. Uh, first of all, uh, like I said, when I first came out of, uh, of the military, I had a lot of issues. I couldn't hold a job. I, 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 I couldn't. Uh, I was very intense. Uh, anger issues too. Anger, very Trust anger, issues. Still the anger issues today. Uh, I didn't trust anyone, uh, and initially I refused to see a psychiatrist because I felt I could deal with it on my own, but then uh, I finally decided to go see a psychiatrist, and she told me, she said, well, uh, this is going to be a very hard, hard task for you. Number one, I'm a female and I'm white and you're black. And number two, she stressed that she did. Wow, she's honest. And she said that, oh no, number two is that if you do the work I tell you to do, it's going to make you cry. It's going to make you want to be angry, but it's going to give you results. 
And I want to know now, do you want me to be your psychiatrist? You want someone different? So I said, I'll try it. And she said, the third thing is that everything we discuss, you must write down longhand. You got to write it on paper. And I said, I'll try it. And that's how the book got started. It was, not a, it was not a book. I was just telling my story, my life story. So in other words, you started writing down all these experiences that she prompted right. you to, to go back to the, these places. That's correct. And at the end of that, you, it, it came to you that I could put all this together in yeah. one. In one book. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Leon Collier's pen name is Christopher Rowland. And I'm, I'm going to say this early in this interview. Um, I'm not finished reading the book, but I'm almost finished. And But once I picked it up, I couldn't put it down. So you really need to check this book out. And one of the things that got me in the book is his early years, before the military, as a child. Because it sent me back mm -hmm. to my childhood growing up in Jamaica on a farm. Mm -hmm you know, working with the crops. The, bi the biggest difference, and my heart goes out to anyone who en encounters this situation, is sharecropping. Yeah, yeah. Now, in the book, you talk about an uncle that had to pay five, I think, sixth of the cotton that he gr we grew mm -hmm. to the sharecropper and then one sixth of something else to him. But at the end of the, the, the year, he had nothing left. Right. How did that make you feel as a child? Did you feel that you don't want to end up in this scenario? You don't want to end up here? You want to get away from this? We had no choice, actually. Uh, uh, we had our own farm, uh, but also we had to work for a white family, which is called the Service Cues, the very rich. They own all kind of animals, cows, pigs, uh, chicken farms, and also picking cotton. So uh, my uncle had uh, four sons, mm -hmm. included, and, and also me. I was the youngest of them all. And we had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, drive to their farm, pick their cotton, uh, slop their hogs, feed their cattle, and return back to our farm and do our farming. Uh, the, the seeds and the plants that we had at our farm, my uncle had to borrow from them. So he had to owe them for that? He had to owe them for that. Wow. And then when we came in for the harvest, uh, most of that would really go back to them. So you end up with nothing? You end up with nothing. So that was, that was the thing we went through year after year on that process. And uh, I noticed that in that you're not talking about no school either. There's no... Well, the school at that time was, was um, kind of forbidden for black people in terms mm. of, I mean, it was segregation at that time. They had white schools and had black schools. Uh, and I really wanted to go to school, but it was like, if you want to talk about going to school, you was like, you're going to get a beating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your job is to stay out there in the field and mm -hmm. pick cotton, stuff like that. Or do your chores, and if there's time, mm -hmm. you go to school. Mm -hmm. So what I did is, is I, I would do my chores and walk 35 miles to school. Mm. And I had uh, no really good clothes. Actually, my clothes... Your hand downs. It was something like what you see today with, pe with, with the knees cut, cut out. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The shoes had no, no bottom. And I was lucky in a sense that my first grade teacher, she loved me. So she would give me her son hand Second down hand clothes. clothes. Okay. Uh, so, but during the harvest time, no one went to school. We all stayed in, in the fields and we picked cotton or whatever we had to do until it all was done. So we missed a great, a great deal of schooling. Okay. Altogether. Now, let me ask you something now about this book. What do, you ex what do you think or what do you hope someone who picks up this book, Life Struggle of a Vietnam Veteran out of the Vietnam War, doesn't have to be us, anyone who has uh, any military connections. There are in, in information in here that could help anyone, but what is it in particular that you would like to see that you could tell them they could gain by reading your book? 
Well, in the first part, I think it, it shows that uh, even though the odds are very against you when you're growing up as, as, as a child, if you have just only one adult who will give you that important idea that you can succeed. Can you say you, that again for me, please? If you only have one adult who, who will support you or will, will encourage you, take heed to that. Uh, in terms of, uh, of the military experiences is that, as you said earlier, I think I was prepared for military before I went to the service, but I came out of the military with a lot of issues. And you, you kind of feel initially that you can handle it, mm -hmm. you can't handle it. So my, my book is really to say, you got to ask for help. Okay. You got to ask for help. Okay. Now listen, as a Special Forces member, I could understand why you came out feeling that you could handle it, because that's what you guys do. Yeah. But I would like for you to tell the audience where they could find your book and... Well, my book can be found at Barnes & Noble's, uh, it can be found at Amazon, you can find it at all your major bookstores, or you can get it directly from Author House. Okay, and again, ladies and gentlemen, this book is Life Struggle of a Vietnam Veteran. Life Struggle of a Vietnam Veteran out of the Vietnam War. And the pen name is Christopher Rawlin. But we're talking with Mr. Leon Collier. So when you find, go to find the book, remember, Life Struggle of a Vietnam Veteran out of the Vietnam War by Christopher Rawlin. Listen, veteran. Thank you. I want to thank you, thank you for coming on the show and taking that courage to share and to open up the way you opened up. And I'm quite sure that there are a lot of folks that this will help. So that, that, that dove that you see flew off when your aunt passed, that dove is still with you, brother. And mm -hmm. it's the spirituality that kept you from that stump, that, that wood stump. Mm -hmm. And it's the spiritual, spirituality that brought you back here and it's the spirituality that has you right now. And I thank you so much for coming on the thank show this year. So ladies and gentlemen, again, I want to thank you for tuning in to the Sir Squeeze Back Show. And I would really, really appreciate it if you check this book out, Life Struggle of a Vietnam Veteran by Christopher Rawlin. He told you where you could get it. I could tell you a couple of places off the top of my head. Barnes & Noble. Walmart, Amazon, and we're going to see what we could do about having the VA push this book. Thank you. Thank you. From the day I know, man, I say, you have been trodden along, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have been trodden along, yeah. From the day I know, man, I say, we have been helping out here. Yeah. Everything, everything will be alright. Oh. Man, I say you are the greatest. Whoa, yo, whoa, yo, man, I say you are the greatest around. Sometimes when things get rough, man, I say. Just calm, just calm you down. 